Hello, I'm John Grum, and welcome to the 66th Right and Left Discussion Forum. We hold our panel discussion twice monthly to provide an example of how civil discourse can shine a light on complex topics through careful listening and thoughtful consideration. Today, our panel will discuss the First Amendment, its complicated history, and its current challenges. Today's panel, beginning on my left, is Patty Haskins, retired math teacher and current member of the Wadsworth City Council. On her left is Jerry Ritzman, chairman of the board of Ritzman Natural Health Pharmacies. On his left is Ron Chamberlain. Welcome back, Ron, after an absence. We certainly enjoy having you back. Uh, Ron is a, um, a retired senior research chemist. Um, on uh, his left is Brian Lawbaugh, president of R&B Financial Services. We're going to begin our discussion with Patty Haskins. Patty, as you know, the First Amendment to the Constitution addresses many basic freedoms, including the freedom of speech. It has been tested many times in the Supreme Court and compromised to some extent. Today, in what has been referred to as a culture of grievance, it's being tested again by many who don't seem to see the irony in physically protesting freedom of speech. What do you make of it all? Um, yeah, you know, I really think it, it can be very confusing when you look at this. I mean, if you look back at the history, freedom, freedom of speech obviously was put into the Constitution. And it wasn't that long, a couple presidents <coughs> later, before they put in the Alien and Sedition Act, mm -hmm. which stated, well, you have free speech, but you aren't allowed to say anything nasty about the president or the government. And that has been used for years, uh, you know, in President Lincoln's term. They, speech against the government was prohibited, or at least strongly uh, thought against. And mm -hmm. um, this also occurred during Wilson's terms, during Roosevelt's, during Nixon's, all of this time. And I think, has that been a, a repealed or they it just... It was actually repealed in 1918, but there was something else called the um, Espionage Act that right. included some of the same things, and it wasn't repealed until much later. It, in fact, it was what uh, gave rise to the House on american Activities Committee that uh, Joe McCarthy made so famous. Right, yeah. right. And, and yeah. the interesting thing is, and I mean, I remember in, in college um, wanting to attend a anti-war rally, and the group that was going to do this wanted to, you know, they had to have a permit which is interesting, but they did have to have a permit, and this mm -hmm. is at a public university, which is fine. But they were granted <laughs> the permit, but only if they allowed the other side to speak at the rally as well. So it, I thought that was an interesting thing. I mean, you mm -hmm. can speak and say this, but you've got to allow somebody else to come in and argue against you, which I'm not sure that that doesn't violate freedom of speech. I remember also many years ago, the Ku Klux Klan uh, wanted to rally in Skokie, and it was big uproar about this. They shouldn't be allowed there because of the hate speech that they provided. The ACLU actually went, came in and supported them because they said, you know, you have, if you respect freedom of speech, it's not just speech that you agree with, but all speech. Mm -hmm. has to be protected. That was a bright shining moment for the ACLU. I, I, remember I agree it totally. Yeah. I agree totally. And I think you know, that's one of the things that, that I, you know, I think is the strongest in there. You know, the problem is, though, there are certain things, you know, that you can't say. Um, you can't, you know, the, the old, you can't go into a crowded room and yell fire yes. because this could, ins you know, <laughs> invoke panic or someone could be hurt. And there are some laws that prevent this. The thing that I'm seeing now, however, is there is so much hate speech being delivered and delivered on the news, delivered by intelligent people. And we are seeing, in some cases, I think, too many people reacting to that hate speech. Can and you give an example of the kind of hate speech you, or, or when you're saying you see it on television? Is it from network people, or is it It's more on the 24-hour news cycles, which mm -hmm. many people are watching. And they are taking, perhaps, biased slants on issues. And people are reacting to it. 
albeit some of them are not your sanest people in the world. Uh, you know, I remember when all of the discussion after the Ferguson issue and all of the rhetoric about police officers was out there. And then there were police officers that were killed. And of course, then the charge was that these people were being killed because of the speech and it called that and so therefore you can't, mm -hmm. you have to shut this group down. Yeah. You turn around and last week you have the case at Planned Parenthood with all of the speech out there now opposed to that and you see someone that attacks at that institution and kills people. So it's, you know, it's happening on both sides of the liberal conservative fence mm -hmm. where people are coming in and saying, unfortunately, I can say whatever I want, but this side can't because it provokes this type of danger. I heard people supporting Donald Trump, and here my political bias will come out a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Donald Trump, because he says it like it is. He says things that in past, um, campaigns would have immediately thrown someone off of the campaign. He keeps rising mm. because he says mm. what it is and he <clears throat> calls, you know, calls a person what they are and if they're a terrorist, they're a terrorist. But when someone shows up at his rally and complains about him, he immediately has them escorted out. I think you're talking about a, um, um, a, a Black Lives Matter protester that kept trying to shout him down. There was also a reporter, a few, and he was from the um, Spanish-speaking station that had asked him some questions and was not actually shouting him down and was removed. And then there was okay. another one last week. Oh, I remember so, that. Yes. Again. So, <coughs> you know, this is unfortunate. Um, and mm -hmm. should there be, I guess the question is then, should there be some sort of limitation on the speech? Mm -hmm. Or should we defend speech, mm -hmm. as the Constitution says, for well, at, everyone? At some point in the next 20 minutes, I want to circle around and discuss the difference between hate speech and hate crimes and fighting words. But in the meantime, Jer Jerry, do you, do you have some ideas about what's going on in campuses these days? Well, um, the yeah, I, I have some opinions about that. I think that free speech implies that we need also to have a rational, civil discussion about differences of opinion. Um, mm -hmm. So many times if somebody questions, uh, let's take, for instance, let's take, if you question and, or if you bring up the topic of uh, big oil to an environmental activist, most of the time their knee-jerk reaction is, it's wrong, I don't even want to talk about it. Their opinion is set. On the other hand, if you talk to a conservative or bring up, try and bring up the topic of single-payer single health system, their knee-jerk reaction is, that's wrong, I won't even discuss it. Uh, that does not lead to civil, rational discussion mm -hmm and Agreed. discovering what some other truths or opinions might be. And I think that's, that's mm -hmm. where we are. I think th your question was about the, what's going on at the campuses, you know, and this term microaggression, uh, and, a, a, and a definition of it uh, in this cartoon that I brought says, a microaggression, I think this is a, a good definition, a microaggression is a phrase uttered in innocence but that could be construed to be demeaning to someone. So like the mm -hmm. email that the, that, that the dean of students at the uh, uh, college out in California wrote, where she was responding to a uh, student who felt that they just didn't fit in, her email, while poorly worded possibly, led to her being demanded that she be that she quit and she did resign. But the email said, would you be willing, because a student had written to the dean, telling her, you know, how I just feel out of place here. And the dean said, would you be willing to talk with me sometimes about the, these issues that make you feel out of place? They are important to me and the staff, and we are working on how we can better serve students 
especially those who don't fit our mold. That probably was a poorly worded email saying to fit our mold, but this all of a sudden was blown into hunger strikes. It was blown into demands and demonstrations and this person and this dean of students finally resigned because of this microaggression and because the person to whom it is offensive assumes that their position is true and there's no room for discussion about it and it's the absolute truth and so that you know there can be no rational discussion and I and mm -hmm. I I don't know. It's a complicated situation. It's interesting, and I went back and looked at <clears throat> a, a letter from Father Hesburgh, who was the president of uh, Notre, Dame. Notre Dame back in 1969, and he wrote this letter to the New York Times because he was against the Vietnam War. <clears throat> and the students were, dis were uh, protesting against the Vietnam War at Notre Dame, but he said, look, you can protest all you want. It doesn't matter if I agree with you or not, but if you interfere with the rights of other individuals, we're going to get rid of you. He said, if, if you're demonstrating and interfering with the rights of other individuals, whether it be speech, assembly, uh, the ability to go about their daily business, he said, we're going to give you 15 minutes to think about it, and if you don't desist, we're going to ask for your student ID, <clears throat> if, you did, if you give a student ID, we're going to expel you. If you can't produce a student ID, we're going to have the, you're going to be dealt with with the law as a trespasser and, and expelled mm -hmm. from the university property. So whether he agreed with the protesters or not, he did not want them to interfere with the individual's rights to express or assemble. And I think that's what we're running into mm -hmm. here, is that people feel their position is absolute and established, yeah. and there's no room for discussion between any of us that might change my opinion. Mm -hmm. is, is might it, is, isn't he the same one that when he was confronted with a situation where a student left because they'd, uh, the student had been bullied repeatedly by these other two other students, and he called the two students who had been bullying this young man into his office, said, I want you to go find him. And you talk him into coming back. And if you can't do that, don't come back yourselves. Hmm. I, did, I didn't I think recall he did. that. Yeah. That sounds consistent with Father Esper. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, John, but it, it uh, that, that Well, I, I, I guess I was thinking uh, more about the uh, repeated cases where uh, students absolutely refuse to listen yeah. to any dissenting opinion and will shout down anyone who disagrees. And, uh, well, you know, so it, much of it that seems denial. that if, if you, whether, if you're on one side of an issue and you honestly don't understand it and you ask somebody, well, explain this to me, they look at you like you're intellectually or morally ignorant mm -hmm. and, and, and that you're unenlightened and they won't even discuss it. Yeah. Why is that? Is that because they yeah. don't know the points that have led them to their conclusion or their opinion? Mm -hmm. And then yeah. what do they do a lot of times? They attack you individually. Yeah. They call yes. you ignorant. They call you, well, you should know that. Well, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. maybe I don't, and maybe I want you to enlighten me. <coughs> yeah. you're, so. you're, you're too stupid to get a response. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Because <laughs> I suspect a lot of times that they don't know the reasoning behind their yeah, position. Yeah, it's just a feeling. Ron, what are your feelings? Thoughts, excuse me, I don't really care about your feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, I, I think you hit on something here in terms of the civility issue, and it's certainly relevant to our group, uh, <sighs> to the time just thing we're trying to promote. I read the First Amendment last night, and I read a very interesting uh, uh, historical discussion about it on Wikipedia, of all places, and it's well researched. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with not only the freedom of speech, but the, the establishment of religion and all that stuff. But, uh, and I don't know if this is a, a modern phenomenon or whether it's human nature, and I suspect it's some of the latter, but it's reasoning, it's, it's faulty reasoning from a, 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 a small area to encompass an, a, a larger area. And if we think we have, that we disagree on a point with somebody, we automatically assume that all of that person's ideas are wrong. Yeah. 
Uh, similarly, mm. if we agree that, we automatically assume that all their mm -hmm. ideas are okay and, and, and suit ours. And I think uh, there's prejudice there, and, and I think it's human nature that we, we really want to do that. Uh, I think the civility thing is, is the issue here. Is, is, Jerry, I agree with you on this. Uh, if we're too s stubborn to listen to another point of view, uh, that's a failing on our part. That's a failing on the, the student who tries to shout down the opposition. And, uh, when we went to college, and I'm sure it's the same with you, I went to a liberal arts school and there were discussions all over the place of whatever, you know. And it was back in the Eisenhower era and uh, uh, some of the students who were said, oh, this is too complacent, this guy, we want to we want to get Stevenson and Stevenson is an intellectual and, you know, and, and all that. And we had some good discussions and, and uh, people made posters and I remember going down to Stevenson came by on a, tr on a train to the little town we were and we went down and listened to Adelaide talk and, and you know all that stuff, uh, but we didn't get into fisticuffs over it for heaven's sakes. Mm -hmm. no. uh, and uh, I don't know, it's, is it a modern phenomenon? And what's fostering it? Uh, I don't want to play "Ain't It Awful" here and just complain about it. I don't know what we can do to fix it. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully, groups all over the country, such as ours, are getting together. You read read something to try to promote civility and discussion and. Uh, informed listening by people. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. Brian's got uh, this look on his face like he's got some real thoughtful stuff to share <laughs> with us. <laughs> well, I haven't been microaggressed by anything that I've heard <laughs> oh. or triggered, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think this issue has been festering for quite some time, especially on our college campuses, because we've allowed individuals to dictate to administrations who they want to have come and speak mm -hmm. and there have been some notable people that have been disinvited to come and speak from Condoleezza Rice to very in, you know intelligent people and um, the recent uh, outburst if you can you can go online and you can watch the student from Yale screaming at the uh, individual I guess they call them a master of some sort they're over a particular group of students that live on campus and uh, her the, behavior. The, the resident master. The resident master yeah. for, for their area. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm not familiar with the terminologies that they use at Yale. I didn't attend Yale. That's or the person like that. who's the head of one of the, I think there are like 12 student dorms. Okay. Uh, well, it was his uh, wife, the resident okay. master's wife, okay. responded uh, to some pretty nasty comments that were made about him and about her. And, uh, you, you know, you can read those comments. They certainly wouldn't have offended me or probably offended anybody here on this panel. But the students that were offended decided they were going to shout him down and, and demand that he resign. Um, I don't think they have. But um, I, I think what's happened now is that free speech is only free speech if I agree with it. Mm -hmm. And if, if I don't mm -hmm. agree with it, I'm going to come up with something that's troubling about it that uh, uh, sort of uh, interferes with my safe space, and I, I can't have that. Um, I think it goes back to basically we're reaping the whirlwind of a very spoon-fed, coddled generation of young people that have never had any sort of you know, stumbling block in their life. Their parents have removed it from them. Everything that they've done or said has been great. And they get into a college, a rigorous college environment where freedom of thought and speech is, uh, you know, a, a, a daily part of, of your education. It stretches you. It gets you to think about other things. Um, and they can't handle that. Mm -hmm. And things that they thought were, you know, normal are really not normal. And they lash out in a tantrum. And that's the only way I can describe it is that we have college students now uh, throwing temper tantrums. Mm -hmm. And the young man that went on a hunger strike, basically his parents, his dad is a railroad executive, and the kid's been in school for the last seven, eight years. Uh, he's never been out in the real world, but he's going to have a hunger strike. And uh, the university president resigned. Yeah. That is, to me, uh, that's crazy. Well, that um, was because the, the the football schedule was threatened, and that well, cost yeah, the, university the, the football team, the, the players, some of the players that's on the football team it. decided that they were going to boycott yeah. the game. They weren't going to play, and that's where the whole thing on campus and the 
and the, and the media, multimedia professor got involved and she was screaming about getting people out of there. And yeah. it, It's crazy. I, I mean, we, we have to be able to recognize that everybody's opinion, whether you think it's a good opinion or a bad opinion or an idiotic opinion, doesn't deserve to be labeled as a bigot, a racist, a homophobe, um, and as long as you let that go on, I don't think it's going to get any better. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and discussions like this, I, I think, you know, open the door to show people that you can have disagreement. I might not agree with everything that's said on this panel, but I'm not going to shout Patty down and call her, you know, a bigot racist. Notice he went all the way down yeah. the line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not if you call her yeah. a Democrat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or Ron, you know, I, I mean, that, that just is so far, I mean, you have to have some civility when you're discussing the issues, whether you agree with it or not. I don't particularly, I, I don't care for Mr. Trump. Uh, I don't care for his brand of politics. I don't care for the way he goes about labeling and uh, uh, denigrating his uh, people that speak out against him. He's going to sue everybody. I don't, I don't think that, that, that helps the political right. process at all. Uh, so when well, you start talking, <clears throat> you would think let he'd let talk himself talk. into a hole. I mean, it's not happening. so, you know, not you, you go, he, has, yeah. he has the right to say whatever he wants to say. I agree. And just mm -hmm. as everyone here has the right, and when we start, I, I, I have a difficult time when you start saying hate speech. I'd tell like tell know, me what that means to I you. I don't know what that definition. I don't, I don't know what the definition of hate speech is because it could be something different for Ron. Mm -hmm. It could be something different for Jerry. It could be mm -hmm. something different for Patty. And when you start getting into that area where I could say something, I'm sure that as my, my kids could probably say that, that their dad has a lot of hate speech when it came time to giving them you know, the what for. You know? And if hate speech is making people feel uncomfortable when you're being held accountable for something, then, you know, where do, where's that, how do we define that? How do you know? You know, obviously there's certain things, you know, fighting words. I think people would probably understand something like of that mm -hmm. nature, but, you know, let's define hate. Let's define, you know, what is a, a, a microaggression to one person that might not be to the other? If you're just mm -hmm. gonna make a comment and somehow that's construed yeah. Um, I, I just I don't see an end to it unless people on both sides step up and say, "Wait a second, this is ridiculous." Mm -hmm. Hate speech has been tried. Uh, there, there, excuse me. There's been legislation tried uh, to define and uh, forbid hate speech, but it's never really gotten off the ground. Uh, it's generally thought of to be offensive speech that's uh, uh, oriented toward uh, race, ethnicity, religion. So for uh, mm -hmm. toward any uh, protected group, you you, you cannot. Well, we had a we had a situation in California where the mayor <coughs> of a town, and this is well documented, actually went to a local pastor, and and basically was in the process of of requiring him to provide her and the city council with his sermon that he gave because that was hate speech. Hmm. And it got shut down really quick, but you know it, it, it's, it was it was well documented. You know it was it was all over. I mean, you know, lawyers were jumping out of their seats <laughs> to 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 protect that pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the ACLU even weighed into it, but mm -hmm. she had actually felt empowered to to go and say, "Wait a second, you can't say that over your pulpit." That's where I, I really I really struggle with this because we have we have some freedoms here, some religious freedoms. That are being encroached upon because you know someone decides it's hate speech that the minister says something about X, Y, or Z. You can go ahead and say anything that you want that other people regard as hate speech, but unless it leads to some kind of crime or violence, uh, there's nothing uh, statutorily uh, wrong with it. You can say just about anything you want. But when you start fighting words now are, are another matter. And the definition of uh, fighting words is that words by which their very utterance inflict injury or tend to incite immediate breach of peace. Right. So you can go ahead and say things that cause a riot uh, and uh, you've, uh, you're not on strong legal ground when you do that. Uh, the thing the problem I have with that is uh, it's the person that's hearing the speech that's reacting to it. Mm -hmm. You got a responsibility <laughs> to stop and think. 
I know. And uh, I think that's, that's why we have lawyers and judges uh, <laughs> to determine what, uh, what caused what. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, yeah, the, uh, fighting words uh, are things that lead to, uh, can lead to a hate crime or hate speech if it mm -hmm. results in a, a, a criminal activity. Now it's, it's a hate crime that is illegal, but the, the hate speech by itself is not. Um, I'm reminded of, of uh, such, things as, such things as humor, such things as ethnic humor. You remember the Polish jokes, oh, all, how strong yeah. those were. But I remember... But the, the same ones are called blonde jokes, oh, hillbilly absolutely. jokes. Uh, absolutely, you know, all that stuff. Pick and your, yeah. Back in the, in the 1950s, uh, or 1940s, uh, you might remember this, the rest of you aren't going to, but there was a program on radio called Can You Top This? Yes. And Can You Top This consists of a panel of several comedians, old vaudevillians, and a, a listener would send in a joke, and the MC would read the joke, and then each of these people would respond. Now, there was a Jewish comedian, there was an Irish comedian, um, I don't know who, however many, maybe a black guy. At any rate, these, each of these guys would tell an ethnic joke more or less related to that. And they had a laugh meter, a studio audience mm -hmm. would laugh. And whoever got the biggest response to that, they'd win that particular mm -hmm. round. And think <clears throat> about that. All these jokes were told, first of all, an Irish joke would be told by an Irish guy, not by a Jewish mm -hmm. guy. So you weren't, he wasn't attacking another group. And secondly, there was a lot of love involved. I mean, everyone was amused and, and, a, and a loving comment about whatever this particular situation might be. There wasn't any hate, there wasn't any rancor involved with that. And that evolved, I think, into the, into the Yo Mama jokes and all the, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the Polish jokes and all that stuff, which was a, a step down as far as I could see. And I think that's a whole... Uh, that's just another example of this, I think. It got out of hand. It well, got they, out of they, hand. It, si it sounds like they were laughing at themselves. They were laughing at themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you can laugh at yourself, yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. you're pretty well off. Yeah. I think that that probably goes back to the, you know, in uh, the days of vaudeville, everybody was distinguished by their ethnicity. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many jokes about, you know, two Jews got on a streetcar and, you know, something that went that way. Well, thank you very yeah. much. A very good. I think we're going to extend this topic. I, I, I really do. Get into freedom of religion next time. Thank you for joining us.